This is a production of Cornell University. And so I'm really interested in how we can aid breeding efforts across a wide uh, range of crop species in order to combat uh, malnutrition and really aid the ability to get a wider variety of food sources in our diets. And so one way that we can think of how to aid these breeding efforts is by transferring knowledge. And so the question is, how can we uh, transfer lessons learned from well-studied species like maize and Arabidopsis and apply that knowledge to a wide number of crops and orphan crops. And so one of the mechanisms that we can uh, use to facilitate this net uh, transfer of knowledge is by thinking of mechanisms that are conserved across long evolutionary timescales. And so one of the mechanisms that's conserved across long evolutionary timescales is transcription factor binding. And what I'm showing here is a very simplistic tree, um, but what I want you to take away from it is in the red is what I'm showing the emergence of uh, new transcription factor families. And so there are a number of transcription factor families that predate the uh, origin of plants. And also um, there are a number of plant transcription, plant specific transcription factor families that predate angiosperms. And so we expect uh, a lot of their binding motifs to be conserved in many of these plant species. And so this is the problem that a former member of the lab, Catherine Mejia Guerra, uh, explicitly tried to look at. And so what she did was she trained uh, some sequence models on to predict whether a TF is bound to a specific DNA sequence. And when she looks at the motifs that are learned by these models and clusters them, they follow the expected phylogeny of the transcription factor families that she sampled. So this suggests that the models are really learning uh, the biologically relevant motifs. And so what she did then was compare the learned motifs against the orthologs in Arabidopsis and saw that about 60% of these binding motifs are conserved uh, between the two species. And so what I wanted to do to follow up on this was take uh, Catherine's model architecture and train them in an Arabidopsis specific TF. And so I used, uh, I predicted in Arabidopsis. And so what I want you to focus on here is the area, the relative area under these curves here. And so the black line shows the within species model performance. Then when I take that same model and attempt to predict an orthologous TF in maize, I get a reduction in performance, but still above the baseline random classifier shown in the gray dashed line. The next, when I take uh, Arabidopsis and maize sequence and attempt to predict TF binding in Arabidopsis or maize, I see that this across species model does almost as well as the within species model, uh, despite very different genomic contexts between these two species. Now, unfortunately, uh, transcription factor binding, especially ChIP-seq, is expensive and complicated to assay. And so I was wondering if there was an alternative way that we can really get at this transcription factor binding motif question uh, in a more easily accessible manner. And so we know that open chromatin regions in the genome are really where these functional uh, transcription factor binding motifs are concentrated. And so here I'm just showing a very simple schematic of an open chromatin region flanked by the closed chromatin wrapped on the histones and various transcription factors bound in or different orientations uh, in the sequence. And so the question becomes, can we uh, transfer these open chromatin sequences across angiosperms, but also are they even relevant for breeding purposes? And that's one of the questions that this 2016 study in May has attempted to address. And so what they found is that open chromatin regions explain about 40% of the phenotypic variance in a number of traits in two maize populations, suggesting that really these open chromatin regions do help capture some of the non-genic functional space. And so the next question becomes, can we, well, so I've shown that maize and Arabidopsis, you can transfer transcription factor binding between the two, but then can we also transfer chromatin accessibility? And then the next question becomes, what kind of models would be used to do that? And so one of the models that I've already introduced uh, in a previous seminar is convolutional neural networks. And so CNNs are really well suited for this kind of uh, uh, open chromatin prediction because they're designed to learn the spatial dependencies and relationships between motifs or patterns in a sequence. And this is exactly like we'd expect the transcription factor binding motifs to be arranged in the open chromatin like I showed in the left. 
And so another important point here is that not only do these uh, CNNs learn the pr presence and absence relationship between TFs and chromatin accessibility, but more importantly, the co-presence and the co-presence of maybe larger TF modules. Because since TF binding sites are so short and degenerate, they tend to occur just by chance throughout the genome. And it's really critical that we can precisely identify these open chromatin regions by their context and not just single motifs. And so how I trained this convolutional neural network was using an excellent leaf ATAC seq data set from 13 angiosperm species that was published last year by Bob Schmidt's group over at the University of Georgia. And so what I did was I trained this CNN in 26 different configurations, 13 of which were within species model, where I took one species, split the genomic regions into uh, training and test sets, and then uh, evaluated the model in the test set. And then I also trained 13 across species models where I took one test species of the angiosperms trained in the genomic regions of the other 12 and tried to predict chromatin accessibility in the 13th species. So just a very quick overview of how the data looks. The ATAC-seq causes basically a read pile up in these open chromatin regions, and you can run an algorithm that's known as a peak caller to binarize that output and uh, denoise the open chromatin region predictions. And then what you can do is then randomly sample a group of closed chromatin regions from the genome. So very quickly, an example for a specific sequence or a specific species, let's say Arabidopsis, the within species model, very straightforward. You just split the genomic regions and train in the training set and then test in your test set. And then the across species model, if let's say we're testing in Arabidopsis, we would then train in the other 12 species and attempt to predict in Arabidopsis like this. And so here is what the example performance would look like for the Arabidopsis within species and across species model. We see the performances on the x-axis from zero to one. And so when I do the results across all the angiosperm species I've sampled, um, we see that despite there being a variability in performance across the species, they're all doing much, much better than a random baseline uh, classifier shown in the gray dash or the black dash line. And then when we show the cross species model performance, pretty much in every species, we see that the cross species model performance uh, is very equivalent to the within species model performance. And what this suggests is that without seeing any open chromatin data from a given species, we are still able to utilize angiosperm open chromatin data to accurately and precisely predict the open chromatin in that unobserved species. And so to dive a little deeper into these results, I want to show you two precision recall plots from my cross species models. So on the left, we see Arabidopsis thaliana as the test set. And what I want you to take away from this is that essentially about 55% of my open chromatin regions in Arabidopsis, the model is able to precisely predict them before it starts to begin making mistakes. And so also in asparagus, which the model does relatively uh, worse on, we're still able to predict about 20% of the open chromatin regions as open precisely before we start to make mistakes. And so what this suggests is that there's a seems to be a subset of open chromatin regions that we're really precisely able to identify. And these might be a good starting point while we're still trying to figure out how to predict the, the other percentages. And one other interesting phenomenon that we see in asparagus and a few other species is this rapid drop off in precision so essentially what this says is there is a subset of open or closed chromatin regions in the ataxy that the model is highly confidently predicting as open, which suggests to me there may be some, uh, maybe due to lower coverage in the ATAX seek some uh, truly open regions that were marked as closed. And so this really gets at the whole idea that your uh, model can only be evaluated as good as your test set is. And so in summary, um, shown a bit that transcription factor binding can be predicted across angiosperms, but is unfortunately expensive and complicated to assay. And so the open chromatin also contains transcription factor binding sites and therefore overlap our non-genic functional sites. And so therefore CNNs can predict, um, I show that CNNs can predict chromatin accessibility across long evolutionary distances with high accuracy. And a couple more things I wanna follow up on is how well do these leaf trained models do in other tissues as well as are these predicted regions enriched in GWAS hits and other signals of regulatory regions.
And so I'd like to finally acknowledge my uh, committee at Buckler, Amy Williams and Eric Richards for their guidance. Catherine Mejia-Guerra, who's been like an unofficial fourth committee member and has really been who I'm basing a lot of this work on off of, as well as the Buckler Lab for their excellent discussions on this project. And of course my funding sources. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk, Travis. Uh, lots of clap emojis. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can either add them. Oh, I think Mike Gore has some questions, if you can see them in the chat. Sure, let me see. Is there a need to control for evolutionary relatedness from protecting across species, or is that what is leveraged? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. And uh, we talked about this in the lab a bit, and I'm really leaning towards the second part of that question. I'm, there is re evolutionary relationship between uh, these open chromatin regions. Um, and it's really a tough call because that's exactly what we're trying to expect to leverage. Uh, so the question becomes, how can we make sure these models are learning, for example, transcription factor binding rather than uh, non-informative, but evolutionary related sequence. And then two, are the shared open chromatin regions overlapping with conserved non-coding regions? I haven't looked at this yet, but that's a, a question I definitely want to follow up on. Um, Travis, just to follow on what what Mike was asking, have you have you tried schemes like where you, if you're predicting a monocot, you just use the monocots, you don't bother with the dicots? Yeah. Uh, and and how, how does that impact performance? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because I did do that initially. I haven't, I haven't shown the results here. And it does show essentially what you expect in that uh, for most of the species, performance decreases a bit slightly when you go from a monocot based model to an angiosperm based model. Um, there's some very strange signal for some species, like we saw poplar got very, was very good with a dicot model, but when you bring it out to the angiosperms, it does poorly. So I'd say generally performance lowers a little bit, but not significantly or not very much. We have another question. How to explain the lower performance in maize compared to rice? Yeah, I think I'll answer that question by just sort of explaining why I think there's some variability between species. And Ed sort of gets at that point a bit in that there is an uneven uh, depth of data between these species. And so not only is the data quality a bit variable between species, and we can see that by looking at the within species models are also performing poorly. Um, so a combination of uneven data quality across the species, uh, maybe some assembly issues, some possible tissue mismatching. So there are a number of things that could go into that. I think that wraps up our time, but we can give a, a final round of applause to all of our speakers today. Uh, thank you all for attending. Make sure to fill out that uh, feedback form and tune back in Friday at 2.30 uh, for four more great talks. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.